Hey, what's up, fool? I'm Lauren of Lauren Leslie Studio, and I've been a textile designer for the last seven years. I'm proud to say that my designs have sold in places like Anthropology, and here's also a picture of my rug design on West Elm's Instagram with over 20,000 likes. In this video, you're going to learn about five famous textile designers so that you can sound like an expert in the field of textile design. Are you ready? Let's dive in. So number one is probably the most famous textile designer in history, and that is William Morris. William Morris was born in Walthamstow, Essex. He studied classics at Oxford University and trained as an architect. Webb and Morris designed Red House in Kent, and Morris founded Morris, Marshall, Fokker, and co-decorative arts firm with Burne Jones, Rossetti, Webb, and others, which became highly fashionable and much in demand. The firm profoundly influenced interior decoration throughout the Victorian period, with Morris designing tapestries, wallpaper, fabrics, furniture, and stained glass windows. In 1875, he assumed total control of the company, which was renamed Morris & Co. He was greatly influenced by visits to Iceland, and he produced a series of English language translations of Icelandic sagas. He also achieved success with the publication of his epic poems and novels, namely The Earthly Paradise, A Dream of John Ball, The Utopian News from Nowhere, and The Fantasy Romance, The Well at the World's End. In 1877, he founded the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings to campaign against the damage caused by architectural restoration. He embraced Marxism and was influenced by anarchism in the 1880s and became a committed revolutionary socialist activist. He founded the Socialist League in 1884 after an involvement in the Social Democratic Federation, but he broke with that organization in 1890. And in 1891, he founded the Kilmscott Press to publish limited edition, illuminated style print books, a cause to which he devoted his final years. Morris is recognized as one of the most significant cultural figures of Victorian Britain. He was best known in his lifetime as a poet, although he posthumously became better known for his designs. The William Morris Society, founded in 1955, is devoted to his legacy. While multiple biographies and studies of his work have been published, many of the buildings associated with his life are open to visitors, much of his work can be found in art galleries and museums, and his designs are still in production, which is pretty wild. Even when I was working at uh, the rug manufacturer for you know the last seven years, they had a license with William Morris, so his designs are very much alive and active and still out in the world, which is really cool and really fun because his legacy lives on long after he's been deceased. Number two is Owen Jones. Owen Jones was born in London in 1809. He studied at the Royal Academy Schools and was a versatile architect and designer, and he was also one of the most influential design theorists of the 19th century. He helped pioneer modern color theory and his theories on flat patterning and ornaments still resonate with contemporary designers today. Owen Jones studied Islamic decoration at Alhambra and the associated publication of his drawings, which pioneered new standards in chromolithography. Jones was a pivotal figure in the formation of South Kensington Museum, later to become the V&A. Jones was also responsible for the interior decoration and layout of exhibits for the Great Exhibition Building of 1851 and for its later incarnation at Sydenham. Jones advised on the foundation collections for the South Kensington Museum and formulated decorative art principles which became teaching frameworks for the Government School of Design, then at Mar Marlborough House. Design propositions also formed the basis for his seminal publication, The Grammar of Ornament, the global and historical design source book for which Jones is perhaps best known today. Jones believed in the search for a modern style, unique to the 19th century, and radically different 
from prevailing aesthetics of neoclassicism and the Gothic revival. He looked towards the Islamic world for much of this inspiration, using his studies of Islamic decoration at the Alhambra to develop theories on flat patterning, geometry, and abstraction in ornament. Number three is Gustav Klimt, one of my favorites. <laughs> Gustav Klimt was born in the Austrian Empire on July 14, 1862. The Austrian symbolist painter and one of the most prominent members of the Vienna Secession movement, Klimt is noted for his paintings, murals, sketches, and other objects de art. Klimt's primary subject was the female body, and his works are kind of marked by a frank eroticism. In addition to his figurative works, though, which include allegories and portraits, he painted landscapes. Among the artists of the Vienna Secession, Klimt was one of the most influenced by Japanese arts and its methods. Early in his artistic career, he was a successful painter of architectural decorations in a conventional manner. And as he developed a more personal style, his work was the subject of controversy that culminated when the paintings he completed around 1900 for the ceiling of the Great Hall of the University of Vienna were criticized as pornographic. He, sub he subsequently accepted no more public commissions, but achieved a new success with the paintings of his golden phase, many of which include gold leaf. Klimt's work was an important influence on his younger contemporary, Egon Schiel. And here you can see a lot more of his patterns and decorative work that is used throughout his paintings as well. Number four is Ani Albers. Born on June 12, 1899 in Berlin, her mother was from a family in the publishing industry and her father was a furniture maker. So she kind of had this natural progression towards home decor. Even in her childhood, she was intrigued by art and the visual world. She painted during her youth and studied under impressionist artist Martin Brandenburg from 1916 to 1919, but was very discouraged from continuing after a meeting with artist Oskar Kokoschka, who, upon seeing a portrait of hers, asked her sharply, why do you paint? What a jerk, right? <laughs> she attended the, uh, I can't say this word exactly, <laughs> Kunstwerbeschule in Hamburg for only two months in 1919, and then in April in 1922 began her studies at the Bauhaus in Weimar. In her writing titled Material as Metaphor, Albers mentions her Bauhaus paintings. In my case, it was threads that caught me, really against my will. To work with threads seemed sissy to me. I wanted something to be conquered, but circumstances held me to threads and they won me over. That's really beautiful, right? Albers developed many functional, uh, functionally unique textiles combining properties of light reflection, sound absorption, durability, and minimized wrinkling and warping tendencies. She had several of her designs published and received contracts for wall hangings. In 1949, Annie Albers became the first textile designer to have a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, which is a huge freaking deal. <laughs> After being commissioned by Gropius to design a variety of bedspreads and other textiles for Harvard, and following the MoMA exhibition, Albers spent the 1950s working on mass-producible fabric patterns, creating the majority of her pictorial weaving and publishing a half dozen articles and a collection on her writings called On Designing. In 1961, Ani was awarded the Craftsmanship Medal by the American Institute of Architects. Pretty amazing. She created the six print portfolio titled Line Involvements, and Albers wrote an article for Britannica in 1963 and then expanded on it for her second book, On Weaving, published in 1965. The book was a powerful voice of the mid-century textile design movement in the United States. Her design work and writings on design helped establish design history as a serious area of academic study. In 1976, 
Annie Albers had two major exhibitions in Germany and a handful of exhibitions of her design work over the next two decades. Receiving half a dozen honorary doctorates and lifetime achievement awards during this time as well, including the second American Craft Council Gold Medal for Uncompromising Excellence. Wow, 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 Annie Albers. Applause. <laughs> Number five is Lucien Day. Born in Coulston, Surrey in England, uh, the 5th of January, 1917. She was the most influ influential British textile designer of the 1950s and 60s. Day drew on inspiration from other arts to develop a new style of abstract pattern making in post-war British textiles known as quote-unquote contemporary design. <laughs> she was also active in other fields such as wallpapers, ceramics, and carpets. And at the age of 17, Lucien enrolled at the Croydon School of Art where she developed her interest in printed textiles. She went on to specialize in this field at the Royal College of Art where she studied from 37 to 40. Lucien Day enjoyed a long career spanning six decades. Her post-war textiles are particularly well known, as Leslie Jackson noticed in 2010. Her playful patterns capture the ebullience and optimism of the early 1950s when all the pent-up creative energy of the war years was unleashed in a flood of joyous creativity. Attuned to the needs of both architects and homemakers and skilled at creating patterns for different media, Lucien was preeminent in many fields of interior design. So amazing. I love this artwork. Lucien Day's early textiles were inspired by her love of modern art, especially the abstract paintings of Paul Klee and Joan Miro. However, although abstractionism was dominant in her work, Lucien also perpetuated the English tradition of patterns based on plant forms, often incorporating stylized motifs derived from nature, such as leaves, flowers, twigs, and seed pods. After dabbling in painterly textural abstraction during the 1960s, she experimented with hard-edged, multi-layered geometric designs composed of squares, circles, diamonds, stripes, very geometric, very modern, during the mid to late 1960s. Stylized florals and ar ar arboreal designs remained recurrent motifs until the mid-1970s. Lucien Day believed that good design should be affordable and in 2003 she told the Scotsman newspaper that she had been very interested in modern painting, although I didn't want to be a painter. I put my inspiration from painting into my textiles, partly because I was supposed I was just very practical. I still am. I wanted the work I was doing to be seen by people and to be used by people. They had been starved of interesting things for their homes in the war years, either in textiles or in furniture. How amazing is that, that she, you know, kind of abandoned her dream of being a painter so that she could put that work, that same inspiration into her textile patterns. That's just so amazing to me. So thank you so much for watching. I wanna introduce you to my free workshop. The link is in the description. If you are at all interested in becoming a textile designer, I have a free training for you. Click the link in the description and you will be able to access it right away. And for those of you, um, I would love for you to join the Design Tribe. This is my free Facebook group and we're just a community of designers and small business owners just sharing design tips and business growth strategies. You can also listen to the podcast version of this show on iTunes or on Spotify. Please share ideas with me. Tell me who your favorite textile designer is. Leave me a comment and uh, I'll be sure to respond to you. Click the bell to get notified every time I come out with a new video. And you can head over to my website, laurenlesley.com, for a free surprise. Make sure to follow me on Instagram at Lauren Leslie Studio. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.